Hello and welcome to this video. Um, I've just read the news that what the great drummer Ralph Humphrey from the Don Ellis band, from Frank Zappa's band and from hundreds and hundreds of sessions on hundreds and hundreds of classic albums has died. I think he died on the 23rd of April, a few days back now. Um, that would normally be uh, awful news, you know, for anybody who's a fan of prog or jazz or fusion. Um, for me, it's 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 a it's a real shock. Um, a few months ago, um, Ralph, who is not, in my opinion, is not only one of the greatest drummers of the twentieth century, a pioneering drummer, um, especially for anyone who plays tom time signature stuff or complex music. Um, but he was also um, a huge influence on me specifically. One of the first albums I ever got into as a kid was a, a Manhattan Transfer album. It's thought the, called Extensions, the one that's got Birdland on, and, and on that is the drummer Ralph Humphrey. He's one of the first drummers I ever heard play, and I copied a lot of what he did on that album. So, very important drummer to me. So, you can imagine my surprise a few months ago when I noticed his name cropping up in the comments on my YouTube channel. He, he'd become a fan of this channel, which is an incredible thing. Um, I got in touch with him, we started talking via email, and... Um, I asked him if I could do an interview with him uh, and he said yes so I um, I enlisted the help of the great drummer from the Mavish New Project and various other things Greg Bendian and we decided to do it together um, and we filmed an interview only a few weeks ago um, Greg had computer problems uh, whilst we were filming it and we lost Greg, his computer went down um, and uh, we managed to get Greg back in but um, Greg, this interview is a long interview, we, we really covered Ralph's career um, so it's it's doubly shocking because um, it seems only a few days ago that I was chatting to Ralph and he was so um, gracious and eloquent and kind with his time and, and so informative, an absolutely lovely person. I, I'm, I, am in, in, I am in real shock, to be honest, uh, just hearing this news. I really am. Anyway, um, normally I would be in here doing a tribute to him, but uh, um, what you're going to see now is an extract from the interview that we did. Um, it's at the point where Greg's Greg Bendian's uh, computer's failed and he's sort of lost and he, he, he comes back in uh, a little bit stressed up halfway through the interview. So it's an interesting interview, but this is an extract of it. Uh, at the moment of filming this video, um, Greg hasn't put the full interview up, but I'm sure he will at some point. It's an invaluable source and record of one of the great drummers of the 20th century who played on some of the most important, you know, fusion, prog, jazz, whatever you want to call them, some of the most important albums in uh, music history. And even more poignant that uh, it must be uh, Ralph's uh, last interview uh, and the last time we get to see him and, and see him talk and talk about music. Um, so anyway, what you're about to see is that video. So... Um, uh, I hope you enjoy it and um, uh, please put in the comments what you think and so uh, here it is, me and Greg Bendian's interview with the late great Ralph Humphrey. Thanks for watching. Right. Hello everybody, here I am with the legendary drummer Ralph Humphrey from the Don Ellis Band and from the Frank Zappa Band. Um, we've been chatting all afternoon and uh, we've had computer problems and we may have lost, it may be the great lost interview, mightn't it, Ralph, <laughs> that we've had discussing all these different things musically and uh, we've just back, just uh, jumped back online. We've lost Greg Bendian, who was in the conversation, but uh, me and Greg just started chatting and, and we were, I was just about to ask Greg, what was the music you grew up listening to? And I thought, well, let's just hit record and see what we get, Ralph. So, uh, you know, what, what was in your house growing up? Well, my mother was a pianist and uh, she played light classics, you know, although she played, you know, some Chopin and Debussy and um, she was pretty good. And uh, she, she listened to a lot of uh, ragtime, Dixieland. Um, so I was listening to a lot of that and kind of getting into the whole idea of swing 
And, uh, you know, but I was a clarinetist. I started clarinet at age nine and uh, became pretty proficient, actually. And I went through high school and junior college as a clarinetist. So I played about 12 years and my mother would accompany me on these little festivals and I would earn, you know, red and blue rib ribbons and things like that. And uh, but that's how I learned how to read was by playing the clarinet. And of course, learning how to play in an ensemble, uh, playing the clarinet was also valuable to me for later on when I played in the ensembles of Don Ellis and Frank Zappa and others. So, you know, I, I thank my mother for my early education in music and I, I came to love it. Uh, I, I knew that I sort of had a propensity toward it. And, uh, and that kind of, that's kind of how it started. And you and you're involved. I mean, you're known for playing some incredibly complex and innovative, you know, music with Don and Frank. How how do you feel melody relates to dense rhythms? How do how do you think they relate? Well, they relate perfectly. Uh, you know, melody is so important in music, and most people relate to melody more than anything else. Uh, so if you can sing the melody to something. You're also singing the rhythm of that melody, you know, without even knowing what the rhythm might be, uh, because the melody is telling you what the rhythm is. And so I, I relate a lot to melody in music, and I think it helped me a lot with uh, playing with Don and playing with Frank. Uh, but before that, when I was, you know, in high school, just practicing the drums, I played a lot to the Dave Brubeck Quartet, uh, and the melody there was so important, you know. Uh, I can sing every note that uh, that Dave played and, and, and the sax player as well. Uh, 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 but of course, I, I was in love with Joe Morello, but uh, I, I kind of learned how to play in five in high school before I even know that it was going to turn out to be valuable later on in my career. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I, 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 I think Brubeck was, you know, he was the first pioneer of time signatures, wasn't he? And that was so important. And, and I've always felt there was a relationship between Brubeck and Don Ellis, and I've never been able to quite work out that, what that is. But this, what you've said about melody is very interesting, and because I'll show off with my students, and I'll play, I'll play a ten over four, but I don't really know what a ten over four is. I just think of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the melody yeah. off of Montana is my ten over four. You know, that is exactly. that is. It's the melody exactly. that does it. It's it's the it's the sh it's the shape, you know, of of the melody, the contour. Yeah. I feel is 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 where rhythm is. It's a it's a really interesting thing. So that's that's very interesting. You started on clarinet. How, how did you start on drums? How did how did drumming uh, coming that, about? That, that's interesting too. Uh, in high school, uh, I guess I was always sort of interested in drums, although. I didn't know that I would eventually play the drums, but I didn't know what I was going to do anyhow. I mean, I was playing clarinet at the time, and uh, uh, but um, I was. Uh, my mom bought this record called Pete Fountain Day. Pete Fountain's a great clarinetist, jazz sort of jazz clarinetist, um, and I was trying to play along with him, you know, learning about his licks and whatnot, because I was definitely interested in, in jazz and all that sort mm. of thing. But he had a drummer in his band, and his name was Jack Sperling. And Jack Sperling was a great session musician in Los Angeles. Um, but he happened to also play with Pete. And and so as I was lis listening to Pete, I was also beginning to listen to Jack and what he was doing, and it really turned me on. And so at that point, I think I asked my mom for a pair of sticks, uh, just so I could maybe tap along you know, uh, with what was going on. And uh, the next thing I know, I'm, uh, I'm playing clarinet in this Dixieland band, this high school Dixieland band. And we had this one you know, uh, gig at a, at a shopping mall in my hometown. And uh, the drums were there, but the drummer did not show. Uh, and so somebody had to sit down and play the drums. And so I sat down and I, I knew the music and I kind of knew what to do on the drums and that was the beginning of it after after that day it was like oh i really like this <laughs> <laughs> i really like this you know uh so that, that i play clarinet continuously still but 
but I became a drummer and, and started getting into the jazz band in high school and joined another Dixieland band, you know, out of school as the drummer. And uh, from that point, I went to junior college in San Mateo. Uh, I had some wonderful teachers. Uh, one was the, uh, the jazz band director who had a, uh, had a gig band outside of school. And I was fortunate enough to join that band and actually start gigging as a drummer in San Francisco. And that, and that kind of was the beginning of my drumming career. And what about things like the technical, you know, the say rudimental playing and hand technique? Did you have lessons um, or? I, I uh, my high school teacher was a drummer and he would show me some things, but I guess I was essentially self-taught. Um, I learned a lot by listening. Um, my technique was okay, uh, but I, I didn't really get into technique till later. Um, and uh, learning learning about motion and, and, and whatnot, uh, which I teach to this very day. So yeah, te technically, technique lessons came a little bit later, but not that many lessons. I was really kind of self-taught. Yeah, same here. I mean, I, my, I, I learned off of the records I listened to. I, I really yeah. did. Um, and uh, my dad, it, 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 he, he taught me how to do a jazz swing. And he would make me just play jazz swing. Um, and I think if you can yeah. swing, that jazz swing gives you the the three basic strokes of drumming. <laughs> you know, you get the sort of whip down and then the wrist come up and then the pull out. And, and I, I really feel that that is a contained in jazz. There's so much contained in jazz swing. So much. It's like yes. esoteric information hidden inside that. The feel of it. There's, there's a sort of three against two feel. So you get sort of polyrhythmical dotted eighth note thing going on and you get the technique and the, yeah. you get weight and dynamics on syncopation it's it's a, it's such an important education to learn how to swing it is yeah uh, listening you know I, I talk to my students all the time about you know reading and, and listening you know they go together you know you, you you need both skills but you certainly need to have this skill you know um, some people can hear things and they have no idea what it is is until they see it. Other people, um, you know, uh, don't need to see it. They just they just hear it and can play it. And uh, I don't know. I think that's a that's a gift that many of us have that we can actually hear something and and actually play it back or sing it or whatever um, and have a, a sort of a natural understanding of what it is. Um, Maybe we can't write it because, you know, maybe our skill there is not so good. But uh, fortunately for me, because I played clarinet, I really learned how to how to read. And then playing percussion instruments later on in college uh, also helped me out a lot. And did you feel when you got the gig with the Don Ellis band, it was it was was it the reading or obviously you've got a lot of understanding of sort of wind ensembles and orchestration as well, playing the clarinet. So. Uh, did you feel that was the thing that sort of Don spotted? It was a combination of things, you know. Um, <clears throat> again, I, for some reason, had a a skill to to understand what he was talking to me about regarding rhythm and how the Eastern way of rhythm is definitely different than the Western way of rhythm in terms of how you analyze it, how you play it, how you hear it, uh, and the grouping concept. Uh, that was so enlightening and and I totally understood it. What I had to do was learn how to feel it, you know, understand the mechanics. I got I got that. Then it was to how do you get loose in this? And and that was probably the thing that I was trying to uh, to work on as I played in the band was I, I want to feel free in nine or in seven or even in 19, you know, uh, how, how do I open it up? <clears throat> and uh, I think uh, Don really helped me there to to learn how to do that, and uh, I was able eventually to to uh, feel pretty comfortable in just about any time signature. Um, what can you? Uh, I mean, obviously we've done this interview and it's it's all sort of gone a little bit wrong. So anyone's watching this, we've been talking for about an hour, haven't we? Or, and then the computer's crashed. Oh yeah. And I said yeah. to to Ralph, you know, um, we can't talk about that again. But I really would like to get across to my viewers 
the importance of Don Ellis and the influence he had on not only jazz rock and prog. Can you just could you just talk a little about a bit about that? You know what you felt he brought to the music scene at that time. Yeah, well, you know, um, because you know that was happening in 1965 with his band, and I had had the good fortune of uh, being turned on to that first record by my uh, my college teacher. Um, I, uh, I was enthralled with what I was hearing. I'd never heard anything like it before. I, w I loved who the drummer was, Steve Bohannon. Uh, I felt that he was playing some really interesting stuff, and uh, and you know the uh, the band director told the band, "I'm bringing Don in to play with our our band in a few months, and so we're going to play some of this material." And I thought, "Oh oh boy, this is going to be fun." And he said, "And we're bringing his drummer as well." So. Uh, you know, during that time, I had a chance to really dig into the record and listen to it all. I, uh, I think eventually we got sent charts, uh, which was helpful to so I could see the relationship of what I was hearing to what the chart looked like. And of course, Don's charts were not written in a typical way. He would write out the subdivision. Yeah, there would be a time signature, but there would also be a subdivision of that time signature. Um, so you could see the, the, the linear fashion of the rhythm, you know. The, the cyclic fashion of the rhythm, and so as I as I watched the uh, the written music and listened to the uh, them playing, I was able to sort of bring the two together, and really understand where his music was coming from, uh, at, as advanced as it was, because no one else was doing that, and uh, and I, I listened to the drummer a lot. I loved his energy. I loved his way he set things up. You know, he was he just seemed very comfortable in what he was doing, and so lo and behold, when the band did. When Don did come up to to play with our band, uh, his drummer Steve missed the airplane and was and did not play the rehearsal. I got to play mm. the rehearsal, mm. so that was that was a huge education right there, and it gave Don a chance to to hear where I was coming from at the time, and certainly um, at the very least I had some potential, and uh, and he saw that because later on he gave me a call uh, a few months later and said please come down and audition for the band, which is what I did. Yeah, you're, you're, you're such a gentleman, Ralph, because you, I can tell you're a heavyweight studio player because you're doing a second take on this. For all you watching, we, we've been chatting for ages with, with the great Greg <laughs> Bendian, and I'm sat here, and uh, it's like these computers crash, Greg's gone. So I thought, well, I'll get a, you know, we'll hit record and we'll have a chat. And you're doing a second take, and it's absolutely perfect. So I... I you know, respect for able to do that. What I'm going to do to Thank mix you. these things up, I've got two albums I want to show you because I know you I know you love my channel and you love seeing all the records and what I talk about. So I'm just going to grab a re record that's very important to me, uh, Ralph. Okay. As a 12-year-old budding drummer listening to ACDC, I went through my dad's collection, I think a week after I started drumming, and I found this album, which is actually a very rare album, and it's very hard to find anything about it, by Roger Kellaway, Spirit Field, Spirit Field featuring a 17-year-old Tom Scott. And on the back, yep. you have got um, basically a description of each tune. And so you get um, 10 to 5, written by Emil Richards, incorporating the use of 10, 4, and 5, 4. The tune is constructed into two alternative sections. The 10, 4 section is subdivided 3, 3, 3, 1. The 5, 4 section is 3, 2. This was so important. And uh, I, yeah. I brought it, you know, talking to you, even though you're not on this album, I brought it in because I felt you must have connections with these guys, Roger Kellaway, Tom Scott, Chuck Domenico, John Guerin, Paul Beaver, Red Mitchell. <laughs> well, I mean, the great Red Mitchell. Yep. You know, uh, um, that, that, that it was such an incredible breakthrough, wasn't it? It was what Don brought from Indian music into the way we all now play drums, this what I call additive rhythm. You know, how would you describe it? This Rather than dividing everything up into the crotch, this idea of having clusters of uh, 16th notes or eighth yeah, notes, absolutely. you know. Additive rhythm is the perfect description. Uh, uh, breaking things down, not according to, you know, subdivisions of beats, but subdivisions of the bar according to threes and twos or multiples of threes and twos. 
So, you know, um, that's what Don Ellis taught me because I, I took some lessons with Don. I took some lessons with Hari Har Rao, along with some of the other people you just mentioned there, mm. because they were also in Don's band, at least in his sextet before the big band. And, uh, and so there was, a, there was a crowd of musicians in L.A. that were onto this. Onto this. And I think Don was the catalyst. And, uh, and so he's, he's such an important figure with all this. And, uh, you know, Steve Bohannon was a member of that kind of group. And uh, um, along with, uh, well, Garen, John Garen was just a wonderful player uh, in, in so many different ways. I, I watched him a lot when I moved to LA uh, and learned a lot from John. And, uh, and he also had a propensity towards playing odd meters. You know, I don't think he was as skilled as Steve Bohannon was. But he certainly understood how to how to get through something. Just a just a wonderful musician. Steve uh, Bohannon is a was he's a legendary drummer, isn't he? He's really a pioneer of odd time signature playing and you know, I think he's he's not known he he, he after Electric Bath and those albums where he'd really pioneered that approach. I, I think he died in sixty eight, was it? In a car crash. Yeah, he died at age twenty one, yeah. Twenty one. Sort of tragic and uh, really was. Um and uh, you know we talked about this earlier, but you, you know you brought this knowledge into the Zappa band, um, and I think from what you've been saying, I felt that that when you joined the band with Overnight Sensation, Apostrophe, Roxy, and Elsewhere, there was a swing and a groove to those time signatures, which I don't think Zappa had had before you came in, and I don't think you get the credit for that. You know there was a there was a funkiness to that band, wasn't there? <laughs> Yes, there was. I, I agree with you. Yeah. And I, I can thank, you know, what I did with Don, what I learned with Don Ellis, because we played a number of different styles. You know, we rarely played in 4-4, actually, but uh, occasionally we did. And at the same time, I was learning about other grooves and things like that in Los Angeles, playing with other people. So I, I was giving myself an education as, you know, uh, as well as being playing with Don Ellis and recording with him. So um, I was, because I, I always had a, a, in my mind that I wanted to do, do, a, do sessions. I thought I had, I had the ability to be a session musician. I knew how to play with a click. I, I knew all the styles. Uh, I could get a good sound. I had a good feel. Uh, and I could read. I think reading was, you know, one of, the, one of the good things I had in my pocket. Whatever you want to throw in front of me now after Don Ellis, it's going to be okay. I can handle it, you know. That's that's interesting. Um, I, I, when I was growing growing up, I got a copy of Electric Bath. That was a very important album for me. But my favourite Don Ellis album was Soaring. Uh, I I felt the band was so tight on that, and so there was just a, a conciseness to that and and tightness. Electric Bath is quite sprawling and psychedelic, isn't it? And I think Shock Treatment that you're, I think the first one you're on is this very similar. But soaring, yes. and and I love that album. Um, it's it's since sort of gone down into drum history because it contains the tune Whiplash. You are the original Whiplash drummer. So can you tell us a little bit about that <laughs> album and a little bit about that session? Well, I, I I agree with you that the band does sound tighter on that record. Um, I don't know why. I you know we probably rehearsed those tunes and. Uh, played them on the road before we recorded. So everybody was pretty familiar with the material. Uh, but yeah, that whiplash is on that, on that record. And uh, of course the, uh, the ensuing movie featuring that song. Um, I, I, I had a hard time watching that movie, by the way. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, this this is going to be the great moment of this video, I think, is that, you know, the original Whiplash drummer, here you are, Ralph, and I don't think you've got credit for that, you know, that when they made that film and they wanted a hard drum track, they went for Mr. Ralph Humphrey and his performance on that tune. So, you know, what do you think of the film? <laughs> well, I, I, I can't agree with the, the, the film regarding, you know, the, the, the leader, um, his, his treatment of the band and especially the drummer. I mean, that's, that's just not how you do things. So I, I, I was, I was troubled with that. Um, and, uh, you know, Hank Levy, the composer of that, that film, and are you still there? Yeah, I'm just having a little bit of problems there. You can still hear me, can't you? Okay, Hank Levy is the composer of that tune. And, and Hank wrote a lot for Don. 
and Hank, Hank had a great band in, uh, in Baltimore at Towson State College. And, uh, and Don found uh, in Hank uh, a sort of uh, enjoyment of how he was writing, you know, and, and I think it helped Don to, Don to bridge the gap between Don's sort of crazy sub sub compositions and, and, and Hank's more in the groove, in the pocket kind of thing. So Whiplash was kind of a pocket tune, you know, in seven. And uh, the fact that they ended up using the song in, uh, in, the, in the film Whiplash, I thought was kind of interesting. But, you know, nobody ever contacted me to talk about my performance of the, of the original Whiplash or, or even asked me to play on, on, that, re on that film. Uh, they, they did it completely uh, separate from, you know, from me and, and my knowledge of it. So when it when it came out, I was I was sort of I, I chuckled. <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, when I watched it, I I thought as a, a as a, a piece of entertainment, I was entertained by it. And I was drawn into the characters uh, yeah. as a description of how music's made. It just lacks the love. I mean, for me, great music is an expression of love. I I mean, I'm played for 40 years took me a while to realize it you know but you're you're with the musicians because you love them and, and and that's how you get performances out of people I and mean, you can, people can be harsh i'm sure frank zappa was harsh with you but it's a different type of harshness isn't it it's there's it's well, not it was yeah i mean i i could handle frank because i i respected him so much for for his his compositions and what he wanted he wanted perfection um and so he, he he got a band together that gave him near perfection, uh, pretty much most of the time, and uh, and I was okay with that, you know, um, and you know five five days a week rehearsals for three or four weeks before going on the road, that was that was the routine, and uh, and so you know by the time four weeks was up we were ready to go, and and that's why the band came off so well because it was so darn tight, playing this really difficult music. But the, and, uh, the, those albums are the most ex accessible albums, and he doesn't compromise. It's it's, it's also got another level of, of metric density from what he went before. The the compositions, in, you know, mixed, you know, uh, um, the middle section of Montana, St. Alfonso, you know, oh, yeah. um, Bebop Tango. Uh, these are incredible. But for many people, these are their favorite Zappa albums. That band was a magical band, wasn't it? Well... I, I thought it was. I really enjoyed myself, and I thought the personnel was was top notch. You know, I, I I couldn't imagine playing with better players than George Duke and John Luke and Ian and Ruth and the Fowler brothers. And you know, it was just amazing. He he, he brought something out of George Duke, didn't he? Because George Duke was he a did. heavy heavyweight jazz pianist, and Frank he turned him into discs pop star, songwriter, funky Parliament funkadelic. You know. Virtuos, yeah. I just keep on this. It's, uh... Absolutely, George brought the funk in the band, and uh, you know, I, I I I relate a lot to keyboard players um, when I play drums, um, and what George would lay down would always be so damn funky, and and I just love playing with him. You know, he was very very much a catalyst in that band. Um, after you left after you left Frank Zappa, was that too? You know, you, you said you wanted to pursue a, a career as a session player. Was that the reason why? I, I, you know, this is funny. You know, people, you know, leave bands for various reasons. Um, I, I came to a point in 1974. I can't remember the exact moment that that happened, but I just felt it's, I've done my time. You know, I've done this. I, I've really enjoyed it but I, I want to do something else. And so I, I made the decision to leave the band. And, you know, um, I never knew how Frank felt about that, whether he was ready for me to leave the band or it, it didn't seem to bother him because he, he went straight ahead and, and Chester, you know, went from that point on. But I, you know, I, I felt fine about it. Um, I didn't miss playing in the band. I really felt like I, I contributed a lot. I had a lot, a lot of fun, traveled the world, uh, met some wonderful people that I still am, am friends with to this day, and uh, and but I wanted I wanted to do something else. That's interesting. Uh, and uh, you you did such a varied amount of work in the session world. 
And uh, I'm going to bring in another album. Oh, Greg's coming in now. <laughs> oh, good, good. It's, if, yeah. Uh, um, I, it, 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 let's see. Oh, he's, here he is. You oh, right, Greg? Hey. How are you doing? Well, <laughs> if you, we can't I'm switch your switch your mic on, Greg. Um, yeah. Okay, oh. so I I was able to get on with Zoom Tech. I'm sorry to interrupt what you guys were doing. Yeah, obviously, you know, carrying on not the be the worst idea, but I just don't. Um, I'm okay now, but I had to get on with Zoom Tech because. It was some crazy thing where they, you know, it wasn't saved properly, and oh. I never have an issue with that. It went down and it crashed on saving. Oh, so I was like, okay, I can't even hang out until I know that we got that because that session and the guy assures me now we have it back up oh, on good. their their. Oh, server. that's good. Well, you know, well the thing this has worked out really well because me and Greg have had a chat. We've we've we because we we got on and we just started chatting, and I thought we're going in a different direction anyway. So I have got my own little video now, Greg, for my viewers, and then hopefully you'll have that interview. And I think we're gonna, then we're going to have to finish that that one off. But does does that sound like a way of going forward, Greg? Is that, you know because uh, we've been on for about half an hour. We've got I've got about t ten eight eight minutes left of this session, and then we've got to jump out because I haven't got. Uh, your ability i don't pay for the uh, extra thing but uh, um so yeah all of you watching this video on my channel uh yeah it's been it, it's jazz it's the nature of jazz you know we were saying uh, you know we can't do that interview again <laughs> but i tell you we started off ralph is such a studio guy because i asked him how he joined the don and ellis band and he's their second take <laughs> telling me all about hey. it Ralph, be before you split, man, thank you so much. I mean, this is just an honor to talk to you, but I had to ask you about one of my favorite recordings that you're on. And we just recently lost Wayne Shorter. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk about the the uh, Atlantis sessions. Well, thank you. I, I uh, That was a special moment for me, I have to say, you know, you know, being in love with uh, Miles and Wayne and the whole 63 through 68 band with Tony and Herbie. I mean, I, I I can't tell you how much I played those records and how much I love that band. Um, and uh, and then Wayne going to Weather Report and loving that band. Um, so- um, Were you ever up for Weather Report? No, I guess that's the one band I wish I could have played with. That would have been- Ralph, you did. On this one, <laughs> that's the closest I got. <laughs> yes, yeah, the Yeah, this. I was just. I. I. Before we started recording, I was. This album was so important to me growing up. This was, you know, this. The, you know, this is one of my the dad's albums, and uh, you know, I learned every single track. And for me, the definitive version of Birdland is the one on here with you, uh, you and you. Jeff Picaro drumming. You know, so. Uh, so. Um... Joe Vitarelli, the composer of uh, uh, Endangered Species, I had worked for him before. And um, so Wayne Endangered had, Species is not a Wayne composition? Apparently not. I know. Uh, now maybe maybe there was collaboration. But, and maybe and maybe I'm wrong, but I, I, I think Joe got credit for the composing uh, of that tune. But it's such a Wayne tune. It's such a Wayne tune. Of course it is. I know. So we need to find the answer to that one. Okay? That's interesting. I didn't know Wayne collaborated compositionally. I thought well, Wayne had everything. So maybe, maybe it's strictly Wayne and he had Joe put it down on the synthesizer. Well, because that's also a, an, an interesting turning point in Wayne's career because now what he's doing a lot more MIDI. He's doing a lot more... Yeah. Uh, synthesized arrangements right he can yeah. and the drums were live but other stuff was programmed right That's right it was all programmed yeah where everything else you hear except for me and wayne and percussion is synthesizer <clears throat> so uh joe calls Kids me up. voices joe calls me up there in this they're in the studio and he says i i need you because you know how to read <laughs> mm -hmm. 
and Wayne is here and we have this track, this final track for the record that we need to do. Can you come down? I said, well, of course, <laughs> I'm coming down. Are you kidding? Uh, so I did. And, uh, you know, the chart was printed out. It must have been eight, nine pages long. Uh, so I stretched it out in front of the drums. I got the drums there. Um, I listened to it down. I, I looked at it. And Wayne is in the, in the control room, not saying a word. Um, he's letting me just sort of grok it, you know. And, uh, and so I, I kind of, in my head, kind of see thought about it and what I wanted to do. So I, I moved the China boy to my left side because I wanted to do something this way, not that way. And um, kind of kind of decided what's what's the first section going to be? What's the sex, second section going to be? And then there's that incredible syncopated couple of times sections at the end. And I said, I need to keep the groove. I can't just go crazy now with all these figures because it's going to just break it down. So So I had that in my mind. And so, uh, so you started, grew through all those, but you hit those accents. I hit the accents, but I'm still giving you the backbeat, right? I wanted to bring both of them together because I didn't want the groove to go away. <clears throat> so actually, when I when I went out to record the drums, Wayne also came in and re and was playing along with me. So he has some other takes that he did that I recall that were fantastic, of course. Um, but it, you know, it took me a few times to go through it until I said, "Okay, I think I'm ready," and then and then we started recording, and uh, and uh, and I got it finally. And uh, it, it's it's a challenging piece of music, but uh, <laughs> yeah. when I when I finished and when I listened to it back, I I just felt so great that I was going to be on a record with Wayne Shorter. You know, that was to me. Uh, Guys, because um, because well, I've got two minutes more recording time, so. Um, Greg, I feel like I've got my little video. Do you fancy just jumping back in with it? Can you do another Zoom out and just finish off for you? Would that be okay? Is that a good idea? Oh yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Are you? Is that are you all right? Are you all right, right for, for that, Ralph? Is that? Shall we do that? Sure. Um, and so, what? Everyone who's watching this channel, you must now go over to Greg's channel and watch the full interview. Hopefully, if he can find it, it's been a this. It's been a full on jazz session this has <laughs> and J ralph you've been an absolute gentleman just sat there you know giving us all these facts and stuff so i thank you all and greg thanks for coming on as well thank and you. uh and that's all we'll jump out and uh, we will get back in and finish off our other <laughs> discussion is that Wonderful. a good plan Thanks. okay good all right i'm going to switch off and are you, are you going to send a, a link out greg yes uh, and uh and and check out the podcast with Greg Vendian channel where we have interviews with people like Andy Edwards. Oh, don't and, worry. I'm going to tell my lot all about you, Greg, at the end of this. So I'm going to I'm going to put my own little beginning and end. So yes, I'll tell them all about because uh, your your channel is becoming like it's it's just like an encyclopedia of progressive musicians. And I think you know in, in the future it will be seen as a very important resource. Anyway. Yeah. Less than a minute is saying. Thank you. That's the goal, everybody. Thank you. Love the music. See Love you all me. in a bit. See you all in a bit. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, Andy.